Hey, good morning, folks. We're so glad you're here on such a beautiful fall morning. It's kind of a shock after the warm weather we've had all week, isn't it? So, But it's great to know that it's the fall. And uh, I just got a couple of announcements. So if you're doing the uh, gentle and lowly study, uh, the verse cards for this week, chapter 3, are located right down here by the organ. And I would encourage you to pick that up. Now, the big announcement and uh, I'm, I hope you'll want to stay for it, is right after the service, we're having donuts and cider downstairs. Now, for those of you who are wanting something healthy, a healthy choice instead of a uh, pumpkin donut is meatball subs, okay? So we have meatball subs and vegetables downstairs as well. You say, well, I don't like cider, George. Well, we've got iced tea down there and some other drinks, and we'll have coffee as well. But we want you to come downstairs after the service, and uh, we'll have a, a really good time. So that's happening right after uh, the service. Okay? All right, so let's, let's stand together, and we're going to ask God's blessing as we uh, worship him uh, this morning. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for such a beautiful morning that we can gather together as a church family and encourage each other and uh, be there for each other but also to gather to worship you and father our worship is our hearts attuned to you our worship is our hearts being thankful for you and we are thankful for you and we want to express that this morning through music as well as through our attentiveness our attentiveness to your spirit speaking to us. You know how our week has been. You know how much we need you. And you know, Lord, that as we come in here, we carry things with us. Help us to lay those aside and help us just to focus on you. So we ask your blessing now on every aspect of this time together. And may you be glorified in our lives and may we sense your presence even now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, folks, let's worship together.
young person that wants to head on back for Children's Church or the nursery, we encourage you to do that right now. Head on back, and uh, I know they'll be getting ready for the donuts later as well, so as we get ready. Before we uh, pray, uh, if you've been going along in the study of the book that we're doing pretty much for most of us in the church, we're we're up to chapter 3 this week, and uh, I think you're going to enjoy that chapter. It's about uh, the happiness of Christ, and it talks about what brings Christ happiness. So if you've already read ahead, you're probably going to know what I'm going to refer to here. Uh, but it, it's actually a pretty amazing chapter. Uh, and what brings Christ happiness is helping us. It's being there for us. That's what brings him happiness. And, uh, and all the way, so like for instance, the scripture this week is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, that uh, for the joy set before him, he went to the cross. What joy? The joy of helping us, of helping us with forgiveness and being there for us. And so Christ wants us to come to him. So I don't know how your week has been. I don't even know what's coming up. Some of you have an idea of what's coming up and you're kind of concerned about that. 
And maybe you're helping somebody else through their difficulty. And when you do that, that takes from you. And you're like, man, I'm at the, my end. I don't know what to do. The wonderful thing is, is that God wants to hear from us. But here's the thing. The tendency in church is that God doesn't have time. He's actually irritated by us coming to him. He's not irritated. He actually wants us to come to him. So whatever's going on in your life, or maybe you're concerned for somebody else, why don't we go to the Lord in prayer right now and just ask him to take those things from us and to give us a peace about it. So let's pray right now. Lord, we do love you, and we thank you for your love for us. And Lord, to be honest with you, uh, we sometimes don't comprehend what that love is or what it means for our lives. Lord, yes, we, we know that we have been forgiven. Yes, we know that we have been accepted by you. And yes, we know we need to come and talk to you. But sometimes it doesn't go beyond that, Lord. We can know those things and it not really impact us. But the reality is, is that you do love us. And you are very concerned with each and every one of us. With how we handle things. With the things that we face on a day-to-day -day basis. And you want us to come to you. You want us to come to you and to bring to you these things that trouble us. And so, Lord, as a church family, we're here this morning. And we are, we are troubled. We're troubled by many things. We're troubled by, uh, Lord, the way things are going in our world right now, the state of the economy and difficulties and struggles and, and how that impacts us, not just at work or, or how that impacts us in our home or when we go to buy groceries or, or to put gas in our vehicle. That impacts us, and, and times are uncertain. Not, not only to that, Lord, adding with that we're in the midst of a pandemic and having to deal with those things. But we have you. Help us to realize that. I know that we try to go at our own. We try to do it our own selves or we even look to others to try to bring us through this. But we're human, Lord. You are our hope. You are the one who takes care of his children. And you delight in it when we come to you. And we're here. We're here, Lord, bringing you our needs. Father, as we pray, I, I, I just want to thank you that um, John Corman is home. And, uh, Lord, he's being cared for at home, and I pray that you would uh, give those who care for him wisdom. Pray that you would be gracious to John and strengthen him and just be with him, Lord. Lord, I, I pray for others who are sick and who are struggling right now. God, that you would bring healing to their bodies, that you would give those who care for them wisdom and grace in their lives, that you would provide for their needs. Lord, I know that we, we have some in our church family that are struggling financially. God, would you provide for their needs financially? Lord, especially as we enter into the winter season and all those additional costs that will be there, God, would you, would you provide for them, help them? Lord, we have some in our church that, that need a job. That seems kind of ironic to even pray that, especially with so many people looking for looking for people to work in their businesses, but God, would you direct them to the right place that'll, that'll help them to, to be who they need to be and, and also to provide their needs? Lord, then there are those who are struggling in their relationships. You are the one who heals. God, would you bring reconciliation about in those relationships? Would you bring healing where, where forgiveness needs to be expressed? I pray that forgiveness would be expressed. Where forgiveness needs to be sought, 
I pray that that would happen as well. Would you heal our relationships? God, I thank you for, for our church. And you know, with these uncertain times, it's, it's, it's really unusual. I mean, our church life is different than it was two years ago. And we're trying to navigate these times. And, 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 and can you help us with that? Can you give the leadership of our church wisdom? Can you give our people wisdom? Thank you for how you provide for us and how you take care of us. Lord, I even think later as we gather uh, over some cider and donuts, could you help us in just connecting with each other? That's really what's most important about church. It's not just the proclamation of your word. It's not just the worship of you. But it's the edifying. It's the connection of the church family together, encouraging each other, being there for each other. Could you, could you bless that time as well? Lord, there are other needs that are here that I have not even touched on. The wonderful thing is, is you know what they are. And Lord, you know their cries from their hearts. Would your presence be so real to them right now? Would you let them know that you hear? Give them that peace, Lord. And I pray that you would work in whatever it is that they're facing. Lord, now as we consider your word, as we look at the life of Jesus and what he says about himself today and how the crowd reacted would you give us wisdom and insight? Would you help us to see what we need to see about Jesus? We ask this now in the precious and powerful name of Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, folks, if you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to turn to the Gospel of John to the sixth chapter, John chapter six. If you're using a pew Bible, uh, that'll be page 564. John chapter 6, page 564. Now, what I want to do is kind of remind you, I do this every week, what are we doing in John? Well, we're, we're not just studying John. Our, our whole purpose is to get to know Christ. So I want you to understand something. I mentioned this to you last week. When we do any kind of study or when we do any kind of message here, the purpose isn't to just increase your knowledge about the Bible or about God. If that's all you get from it, I mentioned this last week, we have failed. We have failed because the total purpose of everything within a church, whether it's from a book study that we do or a message that we give, or a Sunday school lesson or whatever, is to get you to grow closer in your relationship with Jesus. If you're not growing in that relationship with Christ, and all you're getting is head knowledge, then we failed. Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that if he knew all things but didn't have love, he had nothing. Do you understand? So the reality is, is we're talking about deepening our relationship with Jesus. Now, how do you deepen your relationship with anyone? You spend time with them. You get to know them. Do you understand what I'm saying? You get to know them. So, all right, so this is 2021. So 30 years ago, I met Lori, okay? We met at a Super Bowl party that I was hosting at my house with some roommates of mine, and we had everybody from the youth ministry area over, and, and uh, somebody, one of the guys, gals, invited Lori because she was a roommate, and she came over, and I met her, and I was really impressed with her. She thought I had a nice microwave. That's what impressed her. Not me, my microwave. Okay? Now, I started pursuing getting to know her. Now, I could say, well, I know a lot about Lori, but the reality was is I didn't. The only way to get to know Lori, and I'm still getting to know Lori here 30 years later, is what? Spending time with Lori. It's the same thing with Jesus, folks. 
Some of you have been saved for a long time, and you came to know Christ at that point. But I'm going to tell you something. You don't know him. We have all eternity to get to know him. And the only way to get to know him is what? Spending time with him. Seeing what the Word of God reveals about him. And that's what the Gospel of John is doing. It's revealing who he is, but it's also telling you something else. It's telling you how people react to him. In fact, when you go through the Gospel of John, you're going to be introduced to three groups of people throughout the epistle, excuse me, throughout this Gospel. You get introduced to three groups of people. There are the followers, those who say, yes, he's the Messiah. They follow him. We see that with the disciples. Then there's the religious people. Now, these were good Jews. These were people who were keeping the law and everything, but their hearts weren't right, and they were rejecting him. And the third group of people is the crowd. That's everybody else who the religious people rejected, and they liked Jesus, but they're not willing to accept everything that he says. We're going to see that today. So today, we're going to look at the bread of life. Forgive us for the wrong title up there. George didn't proof his slides today, did he? Okay. Gave you the right passage, didn't give you the right title. We're going to look at a passage today that maybe you're familiar with because you learned it in Sunday school or taught it in Sunday school, if you're a Sunday school teacher, where Jesus says he's the bread of life. Now, we're going to focus on what that means. But we're also going to focus on how people respond to it. And you might say, well, what has that got to do with me because I know Jesus? Well, yeah. He's the bread of life. We're going to see what that means. And that means bringing and finding true satisfaction. But we're also going to see that there are people that are going to have a hard time with what he's saying. And it's easy to do that. So let's look at the passage together. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to look at verse 32. It's up on the screen if you don't have a Bible or if you're not using a pew Bible. Okay? Verse 32, notice with me what John writes. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of the Father who sent me, that all he has given me I shall lose nothing, but shall raise up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. All right, so here's what we're going to do, folks. We're going to uh, break this up into kind of three sections here. We're going to talk about the crowd. Now, why are we going to focus on the crowd? Because John focuses on the crowd, and what he's going to do here is he's going to tell you that they have no clue. It's very obvious to be exposed to things and have no clue. They're being exposed to the very person of Jesus and his miracles, and they have no clue. I want you to think about that. We'll discuss that more in a moment. Then we're going to see what true satisfaction is. You're like, wow, we're going to shift from the crowd to the issue of true satisfaction? Yeah, because that's why Jesus come. What has that got to do with me? It's got everything to do with you. Because ultimately, that's what drives you. You are trying to satisfy 
in your life something. And the reality is, is you can't. You were never meant to satisfy yourself. No matter what you pursue, you can't. And even if you think, well, I can, it's only for a moment, if that. So we're, we're entering into hunting season. Some of you guys are already out there on archery. And some of you, you are driven that this is the year you're going to get the biggest rack ever. And if you get that rack, you will be satisfied. Right. You'll be out next year. Because it won't satisfy you. Even if you get it mounted and you look at it, if your wife lets you put it up in the room, it doesn't bring you that satisfaction. But we'll talk about what true satisfaction is. But then ultimately, can I tell you, we're going to see, we're going to get back to the crowd, and we're going to see about rejection. Rejection. It happens all the time. Rejection of who, George? Jesus. All right, so let's talk about the crowd. All right, we're going to focus on verse 31 to 34. You say 31, George. Yeah, 31, because we've got to go back one verse to understand what's going on. Remember, in verse 30, they asked for a sign. Think about that. That's crazy, isn't it? Jesus is already doing all these signs. He's even fed, he fed them. These are the people that he fed with five barley loaves and two fish the size of a sardine. And they want another sign. And then they say in verse 31, if you look with me, our fathers ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. All right, so that starts off, but look now what it says about the crowd. Then Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you true bread from heaven. The bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. All right, so here's what we're going to see. We're going to see three things about the crowd that I want to focus on. First of all, they did not understand how God acted in the past. They didn't understand. What do you mean they didn't understand, George? They knew the story about Moses and how God fed them manna, that's bread from heaven every day for 40 years that they walked. What do you mean they didn't understand that? They're, they're quoting that. How do you know that they didn't understand? Because they didn't know exactly who gave it to them. They thought Moses was the one who gave it to them. Moses didn't give them the bread. He just informed them that who was going to give them bread in the morning? God, that it would come down from heaven, and they would have to gather it. And from that, they would eat every day for 40 years. They didn't understand. They made assumptions because they truly really didn't know. See, can I be honest with you? Nothing has changed. As a pastor, one of the things that bothers me the most about people, can I tell you what bothers me the most about people? It's not their sin. That's not what bothers me. What do you mean you're not bothered by people's sin? I'm bothered by people's sin. No, no, I'm not bothered by their sin. Why? Because they're sinners. Sinners what? Sin. Okay? Unsafe people can't stop sinning because they don't have Jesus. Christians can say no to it, but they still what? Sin. So what bothers you, George? Ignorance. What do you mean ignorance? Ignorance of what God's word says about who he is and how he acts and what he expects. Ignorance. Because what I find is, is that in Christianity today, we're more living by slogans it's the bumper sticker t-shirt theology than we are by what God's word says. And we know about 
but we don't know. So I, I always hear this all the time. Somebody will have a discussion with me, and they'll say, I think it's in the Bible. That's not a good thing to say. Because the majority of the time, it isn't. So they didn't understand how God acted. Here's the second thing I want you to see about them. Jesus tries to redirect them to what God is doing now. So here's Jesus. You've got you to appreciate him. If, if there's one thing you should see about Jesus, he's patient. What do you mean? Well, if it was me, I would have said, dummy, you're wrong. That's not, you haven't read the Pentateuch lately, have you? Let's go back and read Exodus, and you'll see that that's not how God acts. It was God who did it. Jesus doesn't do that. What does he do? He says, Moses isn't the one who did it. It was God, and God's giving you bread from heaven now. He's trying to redirect them to a different reality. He's trying to redirect them to what God is doing now. Do you understand? To what God is doing now. That, that's a lesson for us, folks. So when you're talking to people and they just don't get it, and they're just not seeing it, you don't need to react. What do you need to do? You need to patiently and what? Lovingly, like Jesus, try to what? Direct them to what is happening with God right now, what he's doing now. What he's doing now. Here's the third thing I want you to see about the crowd. They cannot see the truth that Jesus is presenting to them. So here's Jesus. When you look at uh, verses uh, 32 to 33, he's talking about this bread from God that's coming down to heaven. He mentions in verse 33 that gives life to the world. They don't get it. So here's what they say. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. They think it's literally bread. They think it's something that's cooked. Something that's filling. But that's not at all what he's talking about. They don't see it. Now, can I tell you why they don't see it? First of all, it's not because they didn't have enough knowledge to see it. It's because they didn't have enough facts. Sometimes we think that if somebody doesn't see it, if somebody is rejecting, if somebody is ignoring, that's because they don't have enough information. That's not the issue here. They have enough information, don't they? What do you mean they have enough information? They just saw him take five loaves, two fish the size of sardines, and feed 5,000 plus people. They've seen him. The reason why they were there is because they've seen him, what? Heal the sick, cast out demons, make the lame, the lame to walk again, make the blind to see. You think they got enough information about who he is? The reason why they can't see is because what? Their hearts don't see. Their hearts are hardened, and they can't see. So here they are. They can't see the truth that Jesus is presenting to them. But here's what Jesus does. He just doesn't give up on them. He actually speaks more trying to draw them in. And why he, how he tries to draw them in is, is that you're looking for this Bread that'll bring you satisfaction. But the reality is, is I'm going to give you a bread that brings you true satisfaction. That's me, is what he's saying. So that's when he says, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. So I want you to notice with me what he says in verse 35, and we're going to talk about true satisfaction. He says this, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger and he who believes in me shall never thirst. Isn't that interesting? He said something similar to a lady just two chapters over, a Samaritan woman 
at Jacob's well near Sychar in Samaria. Only there he was talking about what? Living water. Here he's talking about bread. He's using something that they're understanding to illustrate a point. He's trying to say to them, look, you keep thinking that you're going to get bread and you're going to be satisfied. Look, look okay, so let's think for a moment. Uh, in exactly, probably about 30 minutes, depending on how long I wax eloquent up here, we're going to be downstairs getting in line and having our main meal donuts. If you want a side, there's some meatball subs, Okay. And you're going to eat these donuts and donut holes and drink the cider or iced tea and, and everything until you are satisfied. In fact, we're probably going to give you a take-home tray to take it all home with you as well. So you're going to feel like, and you're going to go home and you're going to lay on the couch and you're like, oh, that felt so good. And you were satisfied. But here's the problem. Six o'clock's going to roll around and guess what's going to grumble? What's in the fridge? Because the satisfaction will have what? Left. We can't find anything to truly satisfy ourselves here, can we? These people are looking for bread that will satisfy. He says, look, I'm going to tell you about the bread that will satisfy. It's me. I am the bread of life, is what he's saying here. So look what he says. First thing I want you to notice with me, Jesus presents himself as the one who truly satisfies their lives. Jesus is the one who truly satisfies their lives. All right, so let me, let me explain what that is for a moment because I want you to understand something. I'm going to tell you what truly satisfies and what doesn't. Because I think we're confused. First of all, it is not coming to this church that truly satisfies. Don't ever think that it is. You will be disappointed. It is not knowing about Jesus. That's not going to truly satisfy. What truly satisfies is Jesus. Period. It's the relationship with Jesus. So I said to you, okay, 30 years ago I met her. I was impressed with her. She was impressed with my microwave. I also found out that she was a hard girl to get a date with. That she turned everybody down because she was only interested in studying. So my roommate and I had to figure out a plan. And it took six months to get a date with her. And it was 30 years ago that I called her and I said, well, hey, would you and your roommate like to go to the Apple Festival? Because we were in Virginia. Up in the mountains, would you guys want to go? And she said, okay. Her and her roommate would go. The night before she calls up, my roommate can't go. So I won't go with you. I'm like, are, are you kidding me? I, I, so I, I talked her into going with me. And we went up to that orchard. And uh, I bought a big jar of apple butter. I didn't know what apple butter was then. And, but... I figured it might be something to enjoy with her. So then I said, well, why don't you keep it? I'll just come over to your place whenever I want an apple butter sandwich. And she <laughs> agreed. And so this plan was working, and I was a, well, the rest is history. You know that. That relationship at that time was bringing satisfaction. But with all human being relationships, they wane, don't they? They have their ups and downs. But I'm going to tell you about a relationship that truly satisfies. That never wanes. That's Jesus. 
And the relationship is not the church. The relationship is not the religious exercise. It's Jesus. And he's saying to you, I am the bread of life. I am the one who will truly satisfy you. If we would only recognize that, right? Because somehow we, we adopt in our mind, if I could get this, if I could do this, then I will be truly satisfied. Then you find out later you're not. Only for the moment. But only for the moment, right? Let's go on. Let's look, a bit, look with me at verse 36. Here's what happens. Verse 36. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. Jesus sees right through them. He says, you've seen me, but you still don't believe. What's the point here? They choose not to believe in spite of what they've seen and experienced. See, the choice is up to us. Even though they, listen, I think it would be awesome to be there and watch Jesus do this and see the miracle, would that have been awesome? Or be with, be with the disciples in the boat and here comes Jesus walking across the water. We saw that, what, in, in chapter 6 before this passage? That would be awesome. They see these things, but they what? Choose not to believe. Well, you know, that's them, George. That's the crowd. You know, I know Jesus. Yeah, but we choose sometimes not to believe as well. What? Haven't you seen God answer prayer in your life, but the next time you face a situation, what? You find yourself, what? Still trying to do it on your own rather than going to the one who got you through the last situation. It's our choice. That's what he's saying. It's our choice. So the third thing I want you to see here about this true satisfaction, and this is what blows my mind. I hope it blows your mind. Okay, wait a minute. Let me just stop. Let me ask you a question. How many of you here want to know God's will for your life? There's everybody, right? We all want to know what God's will is, right? Jesus tells you. Two verses Twice, he tells you. Here's what it is. Look with me. Verse 37. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Okay, stop for a moment just so you know. Here you go. You're struggling. You messed up. Jesus, do you still love me? No, no. If you come to him, what? He will by no means, what? Cast you out. Did you just say that here? Okay, let's go on. Verse 38. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, this is Jesus, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. All right, so here's the will of God, verse 39, verse 40, twice being mentioned here. Here's what God's will is for you. Listen to me. And this is the will of God who sent me, that, that of all he has given me, I shall lose nothing, but shall raise it up at the last day. What's he talking about? All he has given me. You and I are gifts to Jesus. When we come to salvation, we are gifts from God to Jesus. And Jesus is saying, it is God's will that what he has given me, that's you and I who trust him, who are saved, it's God's will that I lose none of them. Now do you understand what he's saying? He can't be lost. And then he says it's his will, look what he says there, that I will raise him up in the last day. What a promise. What is that? Eternal life, the resurrection. And it, just to make the point, he says it twice. Look with me the next verse. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. Wow, that's God's will, that you have everlasting life. And listen to what he says, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's God's will for your life. 
that you would have an eternal relationship with him and he will raise you up. Yes, it's hard right now. Folks, we can't get away from it being hard. Let me just go ahead and tell you, I don't care what the guy on TV says that you're supposed to be healthy and wealthy. Forget that. You live in a hard world, marred by sin, stuff goes wrong. But there's a hope. And he gives us that hope. There's something more coming. So hold on. Endure. Why do you think in Revelation, it's mentioned over and over, to him who overcomes, I will give this. In the first two chapters of chapter 2 and chapter 3, he makes that promise three, seven times. To him who overcomes, I will, and he gives a promise. Overcomes what? This life. With all of its difficulties. Because our hope isn't here. Our hope is where? With the Father. With Jesus. But here's the problem. That's the message, right? That's what he's showing us. That's what he's telling us. But again, remember, here's what I want you to see. John's purpose, John's purpose is to show us who he is and what he wants and what he's doing and what he's calling us to. But he also shows us that people love darkness rather than light. They reject. So I want you to notice the rejection. Here's what happens, okay? We see it in verse... 41 and 42. Here's the first part. We'll look at the first one. The Jews then complained about him because he said, I am the bread which comes down from heaven. So here's how they respond to what Jesus is saying. Jesus is offering them true satisfaction. Isn't that awesome? Wouldn't that be great? Give me true satisfaction, Jesus. Here's what they do. Uh, there's something wrong with what he says. He's the bread of life. What, what, is, what is he talking about? They're arguing amongst themselves, trying to figure out what he's, they're rejecting him. So here's the point I want you to see. They choose not, excuse me, they were not willing to accept what Jesus was saying. They were not willing to accept what he said. They weren't willing to accept it. So from the very first statement when he says, I am the bread of life, they shut him down in their minds because they couldn't accept what he said. They reject it. Yeah, but it gets a little bit better. Look with me at verse 42. And they said, Is this not Jesus, son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then, he says, I have come down from heaven? All right, so here's their problem. The problem is, okay, so this is Capernaum, all right? Capernaum is nearby to where Jesus was raised in Nazareth, okay? So I think we understand that, okay? So like, okay, we're, right now we're in Kerwinsville. Some of you live in Clearfield, some of you live in other surrounding areas, but you get to know people in our area, right? You get to know people from the surrounding villages and communities and crossroads. You get to know who they are because in a small rural area, you what? You rub shoulders with people all the time, especially if you've been there for a long time, right? So Capernaum, it may be is a little bit bigger than Nazareth. It's a port there on Galilee, but listen to me. They still know each other. So here comes Jesus. Guess what? They know him. Well, yeah, of course they know him, George, because he's doing all these healings. He's no, they know him. Why? They've known him all his life. So when he says these things, that I come from my father, and they're like, What? Isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, the carpenter? Hey, didn't we have him do a work project at our house one time? 
Isn't he the, don't we know his dad and mom? Yeah, they were at that wedding. Remember a long ago, that wedding we were at? Yeah, they were there. And so they're not seeing it. They're not, they're not hearing because they've made up their mind. So here's the point I want you to see. They could not move beyond their own concept of Jesus. They had developed their own concept of who he was, and they couldn't move beyond it. Because you and I both know, because we know what they didn't know, is that Jesus had a very special birth, didn't he? And while he had an earthly father, it wasn't his father. Who was his father? God. And his mother was a virgin when he was conceived. And while he may have been raised in the home of Joseph, he wasn't Joseph's son. He was whose son? God's son. But they wouldn't have known that. But here's the thing. They thought they knew everything. And so because they thought they knew everything, they what? They reject him. And that's what we see happening here. Okay, you say, okay, George, here we are. I'm ready for the donuts. Where are we going with this? Really, it's two things. Let's talk about the first one. I call it ignorance. It's a choice. It's a choice for us whether or not we choose to live in ignorance or we choose not to. How do we choose not to? Read your Bibles. It is better for you to say what the Bible says because you yourself have studied it. God's Spirit has confirmed it with you than for you to repeat what I said or some guy on the radio or what some person wore on a t-shirt or what, here, here's the other one, I told you about bumper sticker theology and t-shirt theology. How about Christian music theology? Sometimes we hear something in a song and we're like, really, that was awesome and we live by what the song says. But the problem is sometimes it has nothing to do with what the Bible says. These people were operating by their own concepts of who Jesus was and who Jesus is and where true satisfaction comes from. And guess what? They were missing the boat. I don't want you to miss the boat from all that God wants for your life. So that's ignorance. The second thing that comes out of this passage is the whole issue of satisfaction. I don't know what it is that you're pursuing in your life, but I'm going to tell you right now, it won't bring you to satisfaction. For some of you, you think the relationship, if I just had this relationship, then it'll bring me satisfaction. You're not going to find, find satisfaction there. Why? Because they're human. They are going to fail you. You will not find satisfaction there. Some of you think, well, if I have kids, and the more kids, the better. Then you think that's going to find, look, I'm going to be honest with you, that's not going to bring you satisfaction either. Why? Because they're human. And if you're a parent here, you know what I'm talking about. They don't do everything right, do they? And they will disappoint you at some point. It'll be grandkids. I can't wait for my kids to have kids. I'm going to tell you, same thing, same scenario. You won't find satisfaction. My job! Really? Then they give you a pink slip. Where's the satisfaction there? We already talked about the buck, right? That's a never-ending journey there, right? Where is it? The one place we're not looking. Jesus. Jesus. And so I guess I want you to try looking. There's an interesting psalm. It's like, what do you, what, what's the psalm is saying? He says this, taste and see that the Lord is good. You've got to taste him. 
and see. Not, we're not, it's not communion. It's not physically taste Jesus. You've got to experience yourself and see that the Lord is good. Because he's the bread of life. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you for your grace and your love and your mercy. Thank you for these folks. Lord, you work in their lives the way you want to. You show them the things that you want them to see. But I will ask, Lord, that you show them you and how much you love them. Help us to find our true satisfaction in you, Lord. Help us not to be people of ignorance, but people who know you. And so, Father, we ask this now in the precious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. All right, folks, so let me just kind of remind you. I think I dropped mine here, maybe. Oh, here it is. Chapter 3 verse card is right over here. Pick one of those up on your way down. Uh, you know, we pretty much, I think everybody's pretty much got a book now, but it, let's say you, like, all of a sudden you, you decided you want to be a part. The books are right down here. There's still another study guard. We encourage you to pick one of those up and use that for your life, okay? So now it's time to fellowship, right? The donuts are downstairs and everything's downstairs. So here's what we're going to do right now. I'm going to close our service, but I'm going to ask God's blessing on the meal. So what I want you to do is go downstairs, find a table, and then we'll give you some instructions about how to go through the line. You'll see things are a little bit different downstairs than we normally have had them. So, but let's ask God's blessing now, and we'll see you all downstairs, okay? So let's pray. Lord, thank you for your grace and your love in our lives. Thank you for how you are working in our church and allowing us to be a part of what you're doing. But also thank you for this time that we can take to just interact with each other. Bless our time, Lord. Thank you for the food. And we just ask that you would meet with us even now. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.